Um, I've been asked to talk to young people to challenge the youth, so I'm going to pretend that all of us are young people here. And you feel, if you feel that you're not young, then you are welcome to leave. <laughs> but not now, after I've, I've given the presentation. <laughs> I just want to talk to you about something that is not common, but which makes sense, and that is the stewardship of youthfulness. Um, how do you manage your youthfulness? Now, sometimes we forget that we don't have, we, we forget that youthfulness is a resource. It's a resource. Uh, we may be looking for money, and you can get money. You may be looking for a house, and you can get a house. You can be looking for a car, and you can get a house. But when you have lost youthfulness, can't get it. Some of us are looking back and we see what we had, what we used to have, we no longer have. There are things we cannot do. There are things we could have done, but we cannot do now at the age we are in. So some of you are still at that age and don't commit the mistake we did of not appreciating what you have. We are all trying to reclaim and trying to revive what we, have, what we, what we had, but we, we, we're not, we are failing. We're exercising, we're eating right, we're doing all kinds of things. But once you start bending, you don't feel like coming up again because age is against you. So youthfulness is a resource, and my uh, burden is that uh, to those who are young, they may not realize it, they may not see it as such. I was reading the other day, a quotation from someone that, uh, and I'm going to put it in this context, that some of our young people are like envelopes with no address. Um, you don't know where they are going, but there's a content, but you don't know where to send the envelope. And it's precious. The content is beautiful. It's, there's something, that, but you don't know where to send it. Who should receive this? And with all the gifts that we have, the potential that we have, and when we don't have a direction, we're in trouble. Of course, technically, a direction less is a direction. Uh, uh, they say if you are aiming at nothing, you will hit it. <laughs> but, but we want a deliberate and intentional aim and purpose so that when you have passed, you can say, that's what I lived for. That's what I was able to, to achieve. So... We just want to look at that. Um, what is it? And I think our challenge as young people, I'm going to read a text just now. Our challenge as young people is our temptation. A lot of temptations, of course, but one of those is to drift along. Just enjoy the ride. Just, just go where the wind carries you. You don't need resistance. Just follow the wind. If it goes south, you go south. If it goes east, and when they ask you, where are you going? Where the wind takes me. So the wind must decide for you. And it will take you where it wants to take you. But with stewardship of youthfulness, we say you decide where you want to go, and you use the wind to your advantage. You collect and galvanize and mobilize the wind and the current to take you to your direction. And that, at times, may mean swimming against the current. Um, working against the crowd because you know where you are going. The world has so much to offer. But if you don't know what you are looking for, you're going to be in trouble. If you go to a university, there's so many courses there. If you don't know what you want, you're going to be in trouble. And I think that's the same um, when it comes to our lives. I'm going to read a text that I love so much, which I think sums up in two ways what we are about, what life is supposed to be. And if we can grasp those two elements that I'm going to share with you within the time that we have, I think we can find our lives very exciting, very interesting, very challenging. You will wake up and, I mean, you will feel so sad that you have to sleep. And when you wake up, you won't believe, it's a, yes, another day because of so much to live for. And that can happen, by the way. Um, I'm going to read a text in Revelation 12, 11. Um, and it says, yeah, And they overcame 
by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do an exegesis, but I just want just to reflect devotionally, just reflect on, on this text. And you'll see at least three or so elements in that text. And the first one, which is, to me is very key, and that is we are at war. Yeah. I think the sooner you realize that life is not a carnival, that is not a big bash, where you are supposed to be entertained. This is a war. Amen. We are in a battle zone. We are in a war zone. Mm. I'm going to say it again. The sooner you realize that, the better. You've got to choose the side. Which side are you going to fight? I mean, there are two sides. Which one are you going to, are you going to choose? Which side are you going to uh, fight on? And it is also a fact that... Uh, I thought these things were growing out of my Bible. It is... <laughs> It is also a fact that there is no neutrality in this. In, you, can't, you can't be on the fence. Um, it's very uncomfortable to be on the fence. Have you ever seen how wide the fence is? Especially if it's a barbed fence with the barbed wire. It's very uncomfortable. You can't stay there. So you've got to choose the side. You've got, you've got to decide uh, which side uh, you want to fight on. Um, if you look at that text, it says they overcame. It looks like at the end... Um, you will either be declared as an overcomer or the one who has been overcome. In other words, you will either be a conqueror or the conquered. This is the war. And the question is, where, where will you be at the end? Will we say he conquered? But you can only say that. It can only be declared if you were at war, if you were fighting. Now, you may choose not to fight, but by not choosing to fight, you have chosen to fight on the other side. So, like I said, there's, I'm just repeating myself, there's no neutrality. So you choose to fight with Christ or against Christ. And if you, if you fight against Christ, then you're fighting against yourself. You will die. I said to Helderbeck, graduation, uh, those who were there will remember, I don't know, I don't want to sound like I'm repeating myself, that in this world, either you carry the cross or you pick up the rope. And Judas Carrot picked the rope and he hung himself. But nobody... Uh, crucifies himself. Pick up a cross, you'll be crucified on it. It's the war. It's either the rope or the cross, but at the end, it's death. But you choose which kind of death you want. Suicide or assassination. But assassination is for those who have a purpose, for those who live for something. Those are a threat. You know, there are people who, when they sleep, the devil is angry because now he's losing one more person to use. He can't wait for you to wake up so he can be on his uh, errand. Uh, but there are people who, when they wake up, the devil really has a serious headache because he knows that you're going to begin where you left off yesterday. Like your, your waking up is like resurrection. <laughs> you know, when Christ resurrected, it was war. We thought it was over and he rose on Sunday and the devil says, now I'm in trouble. The guy is up again. I thought I finished him. And, and, and in a way, every time you wake up in the morning when you have a life full of purpose, the devil trembles. He says, oh, what am I going to do with this guy? What am I going to do with this guy? Well, with some of us, he gets excited. Yes, he's up again. I'm going to use him. Um, <laughs> the devil is our enemy, beloved. Um, he may look like he's our friend. And the sooner you realize that, um, the better. If you look at that context of Revelation 12, it is within the great controversy con context. In other words, war. I mean, I know that's not the beginning of the text, but even if you go chronologically, uh, if, if, I mean, according to the way it's, it's, it's reflected to, to Revelation chapter 12, there you find that there's war, that the, the, this, this woman who's about to give birth to a child stands before a dragon who wants to pounce uh, on the child as soon as he's born. There's conflict there. There's, there's controversy. And in verse 7, it actually goes back and gives us the, the whole rationale, the reason, the philosophy. What is happening here? It says there was war in heaven. And that war continued to, to our planet. And it goes all the way up to the cross. When it gets to about uh, verse 10, it says... Uh, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ has come. There's victory there. There's the, there's the, 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 the picture um, of, of the cross. And then it says the accuser um, who accuses them before our God day and night has been cast down, has been, 
has been, in a way, effectively uh, has, been, has been destroyed. So you see that Christ, the one we follow, is engaged in a war. And from Revelation, sort of from, from Revelation 12, 7 to 9, all the way to the cross, and there's only one thing that you see, it's overcoming. Christ overcame. And then in verse 11, this is, you must also overcome. But it's not imperative. It, is, it, is, it doesn't say you must overcome. It, it, it is declarative. It says they overcame. It's just, it's just it, a statement of declaration that they did it. It's, it's amazing. Even before, because if you, re, if you follow the chronology of that text, they have not yet engaged in war. Because chapter 12, verse 12 actually says, and the devil was angry at them. But verse 11 has already said, they overcame. So, so even before you get to, to, to the war, even before you are thrown into this great controversy, John can look at the end of the war you are about to get into, and he says, they overcame. And that's beautiful. Amen. That you start on a positive note. There's no maybe, there's no but. Well, we don't know, we'll see. You never, you should never say never. Uh, but, it depends. No, no, no. Verse 11 says, and they overcame. It's like it's done. It's in the past. It has happened. And then, of course, now that it, it has happened, let's go and do it. And that's verse 12. It says, Amen. the devil uh, is angry at the world, and he wants to, to kill those who, who are there. And in Ephesians chapter 6, I think Paul makes it very clear that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So we are at war, beloved. Young people, we are at war, and some may deny the existence of the devil. Well, you've got to create one because there is a devil. Um, if you don't believe in the one that God says is, then you'll end up creating your own. But your own will also be like the one that the Bible talks about. I know what I've just said is confusing. But, but we, we are at war, and the Bible says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Not your friends, not race, not, not, not students. You know, there's fallist movement. Uh, this must fall, that must fall. But the devil wants all of us to fall. And until we can cry all of us and say, hashtag the devil must fall, then we're seriously in a big, big challenge. I um, know there are certain things that must fall, but there are others also that we don't mention which must fall as well. Ellen White says we have heaven to win and hell to shun. There are only two, heaven or hell. And victory must be gained. And that must occupy us in our lifetime. You should wake up and say, how do I win today? How do I conquer? You learn even from your failings, from your own fallings, from your own weaknesses as you fail. You, you, you fail, I can be turned upside down and say, what wrong, did, how can I learn from that? What led to that? And as you learn, you grow. Don't give up on yourself, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. So we, we have victory to gain and uh, we, we have he heaven to to win and hell to shine. So that's number one. Young people, there's war, and you need to choose which side you want to be on. And uh, I appeal to you and challenge you and encourage you to choose the side where Jesus Christ is. So if you do that, you will conquer. You will win. Actually, that's the only way of living. The other way is a process, uh, slow motion suicide. Now, he then tells us in verse 11, John, he not, he not only says they overcame, but he tells us how. Because you can say, yeah, hey, we were told that we must overcome, but I can't remember how we should do it. Yeah. And, then, and then he says they overcame by the blood. So there's, there's death there. You can't talk about the blood. Well, I know today you can have blood without having death because you can go on the blood donation, uh, the blood services, they can just... Um, um, what, what do they do when they take your blood from you and you still remain alive but in, in, during the time of Christ you would never lose your blood and still be alive they would never take your blood and still be alive when we talk about blood we mean the very life itself that's what the Bible says in other words when we overcome by the blood of Christ we overcome by his life so when, you have, when the blood is out of the person then that means his life is out so it says they overcame by the blood of Christ you follow that then here's something very interesting of course, we can celebrate that and get excited, and all Christians get excited. But there's the second part. It says, and, the, and by the word of their testimony. Mm. Mm. Your word. Not the testimony of Jesus, but your testimony about Jesus. So there's a difference. You know, when you look at 12 7, it says the, 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 the remnant church is the testimony of Jesus. That's a different story. But it talks about your testimony about Jesus. 
Not Jesus' testimony about himself to you, but your testimony about Jesus. And they conquer, not only by the death of Christ, also by their word of testimony. And we'll just look at that just now. And it says they did not love their lives to the death. Now you've got two deaths here. You've got the death of Christ, you've got your own death. So in other words, if I can rephrase it, I can say they overcame by the blood of Christ and by their own blood. By the death of Christ and by their own death. So there are two deaths. It's the death of Christ that actually invites you to also die. Amen. You see, Christ invites us to death. Now, it, it's clear. Uh, it's just that we don't want to put it like that. Otherwise, everybody's going to run away. You know, people, <laughs> people go to church to get things. Do you know that? People invite you to come to my church. Why? Because if you come to my church, whatever illness you have, it will be over. People go there to be healed. Come to my church if you don't, if you have not been, if you are unemployed, you come to my church, you will see, you'll get employment. I mean, you can hear the testimonies. I was unemployed and I came to this church and now I'm employed. Well, still not returning tithe, but that's another story. But, <laughs> but I, was, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was healed, I was sick, but now I'm, 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 I'm healed, but still not following health, health principles. You see, What's the purpose? What's the point? And the Bible, in a nutshell, says, Christ invites us to death. Come to my church. It will show you how to die. You see, my church has a way of showing us and lecturing us and encouraging us and, 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 and telling us how to die. It's in the Bible. It says, carry your cross and follow me. And a cross is not a symbol of celebrity. Of, of, uh, don't celebrate. It's not, it's not a symbol of fame. A cross is a symbol of death. So Christ says, you carry your cross and follow me. And I'm asking you, which cross are you carrying? Or are you carrying a cross or a rope? With a rope, you like Judas Carrot, you'll kill yourself and Christ carries his cross and will be hanging on the tree there and, and dying. And this is it, beloved. Those are the two. And let's bring these two together. In youth, they used to say, I don't know now, uh, salvation and service. That's basically the two things. You first anchored in Christ, and then you, because you are anchored in Christ, you reach out to others so that they can also be anchored in Christ. Those two are important. Sometimes we want to reach out to people when we ourselves still need to be reached out to. You can't evangelize the world when you yourself are a mission field. So once you are reached by Christ, you are able to reach out to others. And that's the very important point. Now, sometimes you want to, let's go and evangelize young people. That's good. But the moment you are linked and hooked and anchored in Christ, it becomes the pulsating. It becomes this uh, powerful edge within that I need to tell someone. I've, I've seen people who've fallen in love for the first time. I can't remember. That was 30 years ago when that happened to me. So I, don't, I can't remember now <laughs> how it happens. But people who have fallen in love, you don't instruct them. Tell someone about your girlfriend. And then, let, let, I'm going to show you how to tell somebody about your girlfriend. Tell somebody. And we invite you. Who here wants to tell somebody about his girlfriend, about his boyfriend? Eh? We don't do that. I mean, before we realize it, you have told the whole world because you are in love. But why is it that we must encourage people? We must, of course, we should encourage. We should almost compel. Tell them about Jesus. Maybe you are ashamed of him. Maybe you don't know him. Maybe you don't know how powerful he is. I mean, if I know Mandela, if I, oh, he's late. It's difficult to quote anyone alive these days, but if, if, if I know... <laughs> All right. If I know a very important person, I let the whole world know. I, I, that, that's, my, that's, my, that's my fault. I, I mean, in my phone, I, I, that's me and him. You know? That's me and Jesus. They, you know, just let everybody know. I took a photo with Jesus. You know, he's so famous. And, and me and Jesus are on a speed dial. I mean, as I say, dial and I talk to Jesus. And, I mean, that's beautiful. I had a friend of mine in, in Lesotho. He says to me, check, check, check. The king of Lesotho, is, the number is there in his phone. He says, I can just call him now. You want me to do that? I can call him now. <laughs> So this guy is powerful, but he's got the whole king's number in his phone. Do you know that as Christians, we've got the number, the king of the universe, yes. the king of the universe. Yes. You can pray, to, you can just say, you know what, I can talk to Jesus now. Yes. Can you believe that? I can talk to him now. Yes. I'm connected with him. But, yes. but yes. you're afraid to tell your friends that. Ah. Then there's something wrong about the king. Yes, 
Maybe it's not as kingly as it's supposed to be. At least in your, in your own view, in your own imagination. But once you realize that, oh, what a wonderful, what a, what a, what a powerful king I'm connected to. You want the whole world to know. And Christ says, if you are ashamed to tell them about me, whew, I'll also be ashamed to tell you, to tell God about you. I think it makes sense. But let's look at this quickly. I've got a few minutes, uh, about 10 or so minutes. Let's just look at this, how it happens. Well, sometimes we talk about these things and they sound so good, but you can't unpack them and, and make them work, you know, and walk. So you can, you can understand the practical um, uh, little um, um, aspects to it. Let me quickly say this. I'm going to paraphrase this. Uh, I'm going to just sum this. Of course, we need to accept Christ as our personal Savior. But sometimes we don't know what that means and why we should do that. I'm not going to go through the whole Bible. I'm just going to stay with that context there in that text. The previous text says, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And because he's the accuser, the word accuser, it's, it's not an English word. It doesn't carry just grammar. It, it, is, it, is, it is a legal uh, implication. It is a court language. The accused, you know, in, the, in court, they say, the accused, thank you very much. They accused. So there's prosecution. So accused, I know I've been to court, I know what I'm talking about. So they accused. The accused basically means, it doesn't mean you are judged, it means there's evidence yeah. that you should be judged negatively, you should, you should be sentenced, whatever. But they're still going to argue for that. So if you call somebody accused of the brethren, that means he has evidence against you. But he must present it. So if, if the Bible says the devil is the accuser of the brethren, that means the devil has evidence against the brethren. So he wants to present it. At every moment, at every opportunity, he presents the evidence. And let me tell you something very interesting. He is spot on. You know, when, when God speaks on our behalf, he doesn't say the devil is lying. He just tells him something different. He doesn't say you're a lie. Now let me show you where the, the word accuse is used in the Bible. And we're not going to go to that. Zechariah chapter 3, but Joshua the high priest. He's on earth, but there's accusation taking place in heaven. In that conversation, God does not say to the devil, who stands on the right side of to accuse him, the Bible says to oppose him, like a prosecutor to oppose him. God does not say you are lying. He just says cover him with a clean raiment. In other words, take off the filth, which means the accusation was about the filth. So the devil says he's filthy. It's because he sees you are filthy. And he says, oh, he's filthy. Is he still filthy now? He covers you. Is he still filthy now? So, so he doesn't say he's not filthy. He just says he's covered now. Amen. And the devil is silent. He says, well, yeah, he's covered. <laughs> So, so the Bible says, the devil is your accuser. Make sure you're covered. He says they overcame by the blood of Jesus. So, so the overcoming there is the accusation. You overcome the accusation. So the accusation is that you're filthy. So how do you overcome? By the blood of Jesus. And what is the blood of Jesus? His life. His spotless. His holy life. So when you're covered by that life, then the accusation that you're sinful is sorted. And that's where, it doesn't matter, you may not be smoking. <laughs> and the devil doesn't smoke as well. And, 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 and. So that's not a big issue. I mean, dogs don't smoke. Also. So you can't carry that. You can't carry that and use it against the devil. Because you'll say, oh, you don't smoke, so you must go to heaven. I also don't smoke, so I must, go, I must also go to heaven. So it's, it's beyond just smoking. It, is, it has to do with your sinfulness. It has to do with the fact that you, you, are, you are falling short of what God requires. Even in your righteousness, you are still falling short. What are you going to do? And Christ says, I've done what you are supposed to do. I've kept the commandment of God perfectly. And I want to give you this, this, my character to cover you. So that you can be able to develop your own character. But covered by my character. Let me say that again. In English now. <laughs> that God wants you to develop and to grow but from the platform of being saved. Amen. He doesn't want you to develop so that you can be saved. He doesn't want you to grow so that you can be born. 
He wants to give birth to you and then grow you. So cover you with his righteousness. So that you know that you are his son. First John 1.12 to those. So John 1.12 to those who accepted him. He gave them the right to be what? To be sons. And his daughters to be his son. So that accusation are going to be gone. But remember. This is very interesting. This is Zachariah. You go to Moses. The same word is used. The devil had this revealing, uh, 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 what as the Bible says, they use as a, some adjective. But he, had a, he, had a, he, had a, he, had a, he opposed God. He was dead set against Moses being resurrected. Yeah. You know why? Not because Moses was sinful, but because Moses had committed a sin. And the devil knows what you have done, you did yesterday. He, is, he doesn't suffer from amnesia. He knows exactly <laughs> because he was the one who led you to do that. So he gives God the list. You cannot resurrect Moses because he disobeyed you just before he died. Remember? In case you have forgotten. I know what kind of a God you are. Huh? Keep forgetting the sins <laughs> of your people. I'm reminding you, he committed sin. He does not qualify for resurrection. And the Bible says in Jude 1 verse 9, by the way, and that God rebuked. You know why he rebuked him? It is because Moses confessed his sin. So, now, confession is also a legal term. Because remember, because Jesus Christ is the advocate. In 1 John 1, 2, uh, 1 John 2 verse 1, 1 and 2, he says, I write to you that you may not sin, you should not sin, that you should not sin, uh, my children. But if any man sin, there's an advocate. But advocate is not in the church, it's in court. We've got a priest in the church. All right? But he's also a priest. Because the priest and the advocate almost do the same, the same work. The priest represents you. The advocate represents you. But we're using the legal language here. You've got an advocate. So the advocate must have evidence that you have confessed. So, and that confession, of course, is also a progressive application of the blood of Christ on your behalf. So you conquer the death of Christ and you're growing into Christ. Um, and the Bible says, um, if we confess our sins, it's faithful and just. And that's how, that's how it, is, it is done. It is that continuous progressive growth and becoming what God is, higher than the highest human thought can reach, is God's ideal. Then the second one for his children, the godliness and godlikeness. I know I'm, you finishing it off in your mind as I'm going through my presentation. The second one, which is in that text also, is that as much as Christ has died for us and we appropriate and we accept, we embrace this death as our death and we identify with Christ and we accept him as our second Adam, we want to be his children so that whatever he has, we can inherit it. But then he says, now take up your own cross and follow me. And this is the part that you don't hear in churches. We end there and we get excited. Hallelujah! Jesus, hallelujah! And we jump up, but they've said, it's not how, how you jump, it's what you do when your feet start landing on the ground. So, now, what do you do now after jumping? And the Bible says, take your cross and follow me. Die your own death as well. And as I said, if you want to serve Christ, salvation and service, uh, as I say, you can't burn the candle and, serve, and save it. If you're burning that candle, you're killing it. If you are serving, you are dying. Of course, even if you don't serve, you still die. But that's suicide. In case you think you can do that. But let me give you the, the rationale and the, and, the, and the reason, the motivation for, for doing this. Sometimes we think we go out there to serve because we're doing them a favor. You've got to read the story of Esther. You don't do anybody a favor. When you serve God, you're doing yourself a favor. That was the message sent to Esther. If you don't do it, you will die. If you, if you, don't, if you don't save, you are finished. And then that's not a threat. It's just, that's the consequence. That's what happens. If you don't save, you finish. If, if you cannot use your hand, that hand is finished. If you cannot walk, then your limbs are finished. If you cannot exercise, then your body is finished. That's, it's not a curse. It's not a threat. It's the, it's the consequence. It's what happens when you don't move. It's what happens when you don't walk. You may have been born, but if you refuse to eat and walk, you will die. So when you walk, you're making sure that you continue living. So when you serve, 
It's one way and the only way of, of continuing to live. Now remember verse 12 says, Woe unto you, because the devil, uh, uh, to, uh, woe unto woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Verse 10 says he's an accuser, dealing with God on those uh, legal issues. That, but 12 is not legal. It's persecution. It's physical. The devil is trying to kill you. He wants to destroy you. And the Bible says, woe unto you. Then the question is, how do you defend yourself? And I know some of us say, well, the only way to defend yourself is hide under the blood of Jesus. No, beloved, you hide under the blood for accusation. But when it comes to persecution, you don't hide under the blood. I'm not saying you move out. But you, you, you go fight. You, you, you take the war to him. And if you look at right throughout history, that's what happens when the devil attacks you, you attack him. And sometimes you are taken by running away. But that's still part of attacking. <laughs> you, you've got to read your early New Testament there, when the, 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 the disciples were, were persecuted. And they ran. But in running, they preached. Yes. Yes. So even in the running, they were attacking him. So they moved from, from Kabika to, I don't know the places, to Lorraine. But in Lorraine, they win souls and they baptize and the devil comes and they run. So by the time the devil was through chasing them, they had finished the whole world. So the devil was the sponsor of the whole evangelistic movement. Because <laughs> he was pushing them to do the work of God. So even his enemies are at his service. All I'm trying to say, beloved, is the devil is after us and the best way to get even is to get the souls that he thinks he has. Then you get to his heart. The best offense, as, as some of you play sports and rugby and soccer, no, is of, the best defense is offense. Yes. You don't pack the bus and stay there. No, you go, take it to them. And so when you evangelize, when you preach, that's what you are doing. <laughs> you, that's why when, 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 when Christ says to the disciples, go ye, that was war. How do I know that? Because in the end, just, and I'll be with you. I mean, it's not like going to a party. You don't need Christ when you're going to a party, but you need Christ when you're going to war. Go ye and I will be with you. I will protect you. You only hear that expression in the Old Testament when they're going for war, and it says, I'll be with you. I will be with you. So when you go to fight, that's how you defend yourself. That's how you defend your own children. Now, I often say, the boy next door is three years old. He's four, year, four years old. He's harmless. But 10 years later, he can do some serious damage. Even 10 more years later, at 24, he can rape, he can kill, he can steal. Yeah. All right. So the question is, he stays next door to his four years old. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if I take that four-year-old and say, do you want to come, us to come with me to church? Instead of just filling my car with all my kids and forget that the only way to protect my children is to make sure that our next door neighbor's child is converted. I can't just put them in my kumbi, and yet this guy next door is free. It's raining freely. So what do we do? We open space for him. Sorry, sorry for that. I need to behave here. So, so you open space for him in the kumbi or in the car and says, come in, because we are afraid of what we might do 20 years from now. <laughs> of course, of course you don't tell him that. <laughs> So, so when you reach out to him, you're also protecting yourself. Because he, I mean, you, we have no idea what happens when a young man, I use the word young man, gets converted. You've actually transformed a potential criminal and you've made him the disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. You have even made your area safer, at least by one person. Now, when you cry, says, Lord, we don't know. Our child was killed. Uh, our brother was murdered. Our brother was hijacked. Uh, we don't, I said, Christ says, but I've asked you to go to them. I've asked you to go to them. Look at what the devil is doing. He's using them against you. Go! Take them for Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you're protecting yourself. Amen. It doesn't have to be big, but it must happen. So, if you look at the whole history, 
I'm not going to get into all of that. You'll find that in the beginning, the Revelation comes up, gives us three trials, basically persecutions. The early age, the early, during the time of John and going beyond the third or second millennia, uh, second uh, century, where in, in Revelation 2, you're going to have tribulation, 10 days. Uh, John says, I'm your companion in, in, in tribulation. And then we've got the second one, which is the longest one, 1,260 years. Matthew talks about it's the great tribulation, and it goes all the way, and then when it comes to an end, then we've got another one in Revelation 12, 17, and then because they keep God's commandments, then they're going to be in trouble. But beloved, if you look at all of them, the only way to conquer when you're persecuted is to aggressively preach the word of God. And it says that they conquered by the word of their testimony. And so what happens in Revelation 12? What happens in Revelation 12? Then you go to Revelation 14. You've got the three angels' message. Now, the three angels' message cannot be appreciated if you don't understand the military context that we are at war. And you, you have to go to Revelation 13 where you see that there's war against all those who keep God's commandments. Yeah. There's war against all those who don't want to receive the mark of the beast. So what do you do? You just run and hide. No, you preach. As the beast is trying to persecute the whole world and forcing them to accept the mark of the beast, what do you do? You go there and warn them against the mark of the beast. That's confrontation. So he says, now I'm going to come to you. I'm coming for you because you, you are messing up with me, my program, because I'm trying to get all these people and you're busy warning them. You're busy telling them. You're busy exposing my deceitfulness and my deception. I'm, going, I'm coming after you. Now, the moment the devil comes after you, then, then you know it's at war. Then you have to wake up at night and pray. You've got to read your Bible. You've got to know your story. You've got, you've got to come together to church and, and get encouragement because there's war out there. You can't say today I don't feel like. You cannot say don't feel like when there's war. Amen. Well, the church, I often say it's a military hospital. It is a place where those who are fighting come to and get bandaged and get encouraged and get, and, you know, only, not, not civilians, mil <laughs> Military, military, those who are at war. So we're here to be equipped. We're not here to just sing and say, hey, it was so nice being just we worship. No, oh, that's good. We worship because there's war out there. We worship because there is somebody who wants to destroy our souls. So what do we do? This is what Ellen White says in, in Education 262. The aim worthy of our endeavor, success in any line demands a definite aim. He who would achieve true success in life must keep steadily in view the aim worthy of his endeavor. And what is that aim, beloved? That aim is set before the youth of today. The heaven appointed purpose of giving the gospel to the world in this generation is the noblest that can appeal to any human being. It doesn't matter whether you want to be a medical doctor, a lawyer, whatever. Once you embrace the, 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 the gospel commission, it just sharpens you. Actually, actually, Ellen White says at the end, as a means of education, what university cost can equal this? You want to know what that this is? It is cooperating with God in reaching out to souls. Now, if you do that and you work with the angels to reach out to other souls, you know what happens when you work with angels? That intelligence they have rubs off. If you, thank you, if you walk with angels to reach out to souls, the same angels will walk with you as you do your economics. Amen. The same angels. Yeah, I've, they've just given me five minutes now. I'm going. <laughs> Thank you. There's accusation. I have to fight for. I must defend myself. <laughs> I've got to defend myself. <laughs> All right, let we bring this to an end. The same angels that walk with you as you present the gospel will not leave you alone when you go to present your assignment, your academic assignment. They'll be with you. Amen. The same angels that walk with you as you reach out to the poor and visit the sick, when you go to the lab and confuse on how to work on this experiment, they will not leave you alone. They will walk with you. That intelligence of the angels will rub off because you are used to working with angels, doing God's work. Let me tell you something. If you make God's business your business, he makes yours his. Amen. And there's something very interesting about God. I don't know how to put this, but I want to put it in a nice way so that we can remain friends. <laughs> there's something very interesting about God, and that is God does not want to be represented by failures. Let me give it in your own language. 
God does not want to be represented by losers. So when you represent God, he wants you to succeed. You can ask Joseph. The Bible says, and the Lord was with him, and he was successful in everything he did. God wants to be represented by young people who pass their maths, who pass their geography, who pass their whatever else that they are doing. God wants to be represented by young people who are excelling at their jobs. Because when you do that, you create a platform to reach out to others. But they look at you and say, how did you do that? And you say, it is because of my connection with Jesus Christ. Remember, I know it sounds rough. God does not want to be represented by losers, but you are not a loser because the text says, and they overcame by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God bless you.